sits in the presence of the Most High, then you've got all those wonderful promises throughout the rest of Psalm 91. And we wonder why those promises don't work, and it's usually because we're not dwelling. We've got to get that first part. It's an if-then promise. So if we're not dwelling, if we're not sitting in a place of rest with the Father, then we're going to be worried and concerned and anxious about all these things, and that's not His plan for our life, is it, Ms. Melba? As Miss Melba's lived a minute, and she knows she's seen the good side and the ugly side. So we've got to understand that he has promised us rest. Ha! Huh. So right now, Father, we just rest. Come on, put your hands out in front of you. Just take it this morning, right now. Close your eyes. Quit looking at everybody. Quit, quit thinking about everything else right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, we receive rest this morning. The rest of the Father that just settles us. Mm, we just settle down in your presence now. We put aside everything that we might have struggled through to get here, and we're just so grateful to be here. Mm. Whew. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Mm, that's so good. We talked about how if we stay in our seat, he works on things. And the, what tries to pull us out of our seat? Our head. We try to get drawn out by our head, right? Because our, our mind starts to worry about things. And that's the first thing that will pull you out of the seat of rest is you'll get drug out by your head. And that's how the enemy does it. That's how he works. So number one, rest comes first. Number two, password, believe. We have to believe that what he said, he will do. It does not work unless we believe. We learned that from the children of Israel. They had the promise of rest too. But it says because that promise did not mingle with their faith, they did not enter in. They did not receive it. So we have to believe if we are going to rest the way that we are created to rest in the presence of the Father and in fellowship, we have to believe that what he said, he will do. He will finish what he started. He is faithful to complete everything that concerns you. Amen? All right, y'all get to talk to me this morning. This is a good day. Talk back to me. So we have to believe, password believe, the promised land equals our Sabbath rest. If we look back at in Hebrews where we were talking a couple of weeks back, the children of Israel had a promised land. We have a Sabbath rest. And so when they were talking about it in Exodus, he said you don't get to enter into the land. In Hebrews, it said you don't get to enter into the rest. So we understand that for the Hebrews, their Sabbath rest was the promised land. And for us, under a new covenant, because of Jesus, we have a perpetual Sabbath rest available to us. Amen? Follow with me? All right. So rest is our inheritance. Just as sure... Oh, this is so good, y'all. Just as sure as salvation... Somebody didn't get that. Just as sure as salvation is a promise to those who believe, so is rest. It is just as sure of a promise. It is just as much a part of your inheritance as salvation. But we just, we don't care about that. We'd rather worry and stress and run around like chickens with our heads cut off. Because that's what the world does in half the church. So we would fight somebody over our salvation, right? Bless God, I'm saved. But you let you you start talking about rest, what we're talking about, and not worrying, and people be like, "Oh, you 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 have to worry, you have to do this." And we're like, "Yeah, maybe I do." We'll back off of rest, just like that, and it's just as much a part of our salvation as our salvation. It's part of the covenant. And you get to decide if you're going to believe it and cling to it or not. All right. <clears throat> this rest is a sure promise of a real place that flows with abundance and sweetness and provision. When we sit in a place of rest and fellowship with the Father, there is abundance there, there is sweetness there, and there is provision there. Just like he talked about the promised land, it flows with milk and honey. Amen? We like those words. That's what was just playing. There's honey in the rock. Talking about the, the, the Egyptians and there's wandering around. And we like to think about all those things. But when it comes right down to it, do we decide to sit and rest? Or do we get pulled out by our head? And by worrying and, and fretting and frustration. Because we have to understand it's a real place. i got to get y'all here. Everybody with me? Y'all staying with me, okay? Because we're fixing to get to number three. It's a real place 
and it's part of our covenant, and it's part of our inheritance, and if you don't walk in it, that ain't your mama's fault, that ain't your grandmama's fault, that ain't your wife's fault, that ain't your husband's fault, and that ain't your crazy kid's fault. That is yours. Because you have to choose it. I can't choose it for you. I can't lay hands on you until you're purple and make you rest. I can't anoint you with enough oil and make you slick that you slide out the door and make you rest. It doesn't work that way. You choose it. Today, I'm going to sit down and rest. And I, you know what? I think I'm just going to stay here. And I'm going to live my life like this. Instead of running around because that's my inheritance. That's my inheritance. So, just like the children of Israel ran into a few giants, and that was what backed them off of their promise, there's obstacles to this. There's things that we run into. Will you focus on what he said, or will you focus on what you see? Are you going to focus on what he said, or are you going to focus on the diagnosis? Are you going to focus on what he said, or are you going to be looking at your bank account? Are you going to focus on what he said, or are you going to be looking at that that relationship that's turned upside down that needs to be fixed? What will you focus on? Because two of those spies was focused on the land, the promise. Ten of them were focused on the problem that was the obstacle to the promise. And it caused a whole nation, a whole generation to fall dead in a wilderness. Because they chose to believe The wicked, evil report of the ten that was focused on the problem and not the promise. Preaching better than y'all letting on. So, what are you going to believe this morning? Do you believe what he said or do you believe what you see? Do you believe what he said or do you believe how you feel? Amen? All right. So, that brings us to number three. When we rest, he works. Oh, this is so good. When we rest... Corey, he works. When we say, you know what, I think I will sit here until you make my enemy as my footstool. I'm going to prop my feet up and just go ahead and prepare for that. Uh, Yes, hallelujah. Thank God somebody's awake. Are we going to rest and stay here while he works? Are we going to be always up with our hands in his business Trying to fix things and make things better that we think is going to fix it and make it better. And really, we're just making things ten times worse and dragging the whole process out times ten. Listen, when Jesus came, there's a couple of things I want us to see before we go into the scriptures this morning. When, when, when Jesus came, he said a couple of things more than once. Uh, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he said, when he taught him to pray, he prayed on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? So there's two principles there that I think he wants us to understand. Heaven, number one, heaven is the pattern for earth. Heaven is the pattern for earth. And number two, Jesus is our window into heaven. Jesus is our look through to see over into a spiritual realm to see how the Father set up his kingdom in heaven. And so Jesus prayed on earth as it already is in heaven. Amen? So we got to keep those two principles in mind. When we're studying Sabbath rest, Jesus is a picture in the image of the Father, and he is our visual into heaven. The way heaven is set up, the heart of the Father, all those good things. Jesus is our picture. So when we go through the Gospels and we look at what Jesus did, that's our picture into heaven of what heaven is supposed to look like on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. I don't think anybody has cancer in heaven. I think everybody's got gas money in heaven. I drove by Murphy's this morning, and I said, and then I remind, I was reminded just that quick, Holy Ghost said, are you going to rest? Or are you going to worry about what you see? And then I'm going to be honest, I drove on the new highway, and I come by the jet pep just to see if it was a little cheaper over there. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what it was? Three ninety nine, same as at Murphy's. I was going to be like, Marty, you need to go to Jet Pip. But you know what? It was the same. And I just busted out laughing because the father said, I got this. That's the truth. That's the truth. But listen, so Jesus is a picture of the father. He is our window into heaven. And heaven is a pattern for earth. Right? We go through the Old Testament, we read how the tabernacle was set up and that it was set up as a picture of what goes on in heaven. So we need to keep in mind that until heaven is recreated on earth, there's room for improvement. Amen? In us in, as individuals and in our communities and in our area and in our world, there's room for improvement. So Jesus came in completely messing up the Pharisees' rules and religion. The first thing he did was come in and start messing stuff up. I mean, because they had this picture of God the Father as this big meanie head that sits in heaven with a stick and was ready to beat people over the head if they picked up a rock on the Sabbath and carried it in their pocket because they thought it was a pretty rock like I used to do all the time when I was a kid out of our driveway. My mama was always throwing my rocks away. Colton did it too, I see. And uh, so my mama would go through and I'd have rocks stuck in my drawers because I thought they were pretty and, and she would be throwing away my rocks. And so anyway, <coughs> it's completely pointless. But what we have to understand and learn is he came in to mess all that stuff up. He came in to give them a better picture of what it's like in heaven and the heart of the Father. That's what Jesus came to live. And he prayed when the, when the disciples, show us how to pray. They didn't say, show us how to cast out devils. They didn't say, show us how to multiply the bread and the fish. They said, teach us to pray because even the, the, the slow ones picked up on, hey, when he goes up on that mountain and spends time with the Father and he comes back down, stuff happens. Stuff changes. Atmosphere changes. So they said, we understand, and I wish we did, we understand that if we learn how to pray like you, that all this stuff will just fall behind us. It'll just work out. Because all you got to do is speak. Because you're speaking. Okay, that's a different sermon. Corey, you get to preach that one tagged. All right. So Jesus came messing up the rules of the Pharisees. Religion, self-effort, law. Jesus came messing all of it up. Man trying to work his way to God. Jesus came to mess it all up. He, was, he started out just stirring the stuff up with a stick. Because he understood that people living under law and religion. I'm going to say this. My daughter paused the live stream. But man living under law and religion and the rules of the Pharisees looked a lot more like hell than heaven. And it still looks like it today. So when we are absolved in our self-effort and our will and our trying to make things and fix things and do things instead of sitting in this seat, we are way more connected to the enemy than we are connected to the promise of God the Father. We are listening way more to an enemy of our soul when we are up running around trying to fix and trying to do and trying to figure out and working under stress and worry and fear and anxiety. We are way more connected to the enemy than we are in in fellowship with Abba. So Jesus came to mess it all up because he came to set things right. To show us how to live like heaven. Huh. We get to live like heaven. That is presented to us. It is an opportunity for us. We get to live like heaven. So, so he comes into the middle of Sabbath. We're talking about Sabbath rest. When, when, when we rest, he works. When he works, we rest him, right? Okay? So just a few of the restrictions of the Pharisees on the Sabbath. Just listen to this. They, they forbid the following activities. Riding, like riding in a, on a paper, erasing and tearing. Could not do this on the Sabbath. Against the law. It was against the law. It was against the Pharisaical law to tear a piece of paper. You could not conduct business transactions. You could not shop. No going to the Walmarts. You could not cook. Hallelujah. Bake or kindle a fire. You could not garden or do laundry. Uh, yes. Uh, you could not carry anything for more than six feet in a public area. 
You better keep count. You could not move anything with your hand, even indirectly, like with a broom. You could not move a broken bowl, flowers in a vase, candles on a table, raw food, a rock, or a button that has fallen off. You could move things with your elbow or with your breath, but not with your hand. Okay. You could not heal on the Sabbath. You could not carry your bed on the Sabbath. You could not walk more than a Sabbath day's, Sabbath day's journey, which was 3,000 feet from your home. Just some of the rules that the Pharisees. And people had gotten so bound down trying to make sure they were keeping the rules. And we are no different. We're so worried about keeping the rules that we forget the, the relationship that instigates the love of the Father and causes us to fall so head over heels in love with Him that we don't want to get anywhere outside of that which keeps us within the blessing of the book. Does that make sense? We approach it the wrong way. We're trying to keep all the rules to get us into the relationship. When if we were just in the relationship and rest, it keeps us within the rules. I'm not saying that we don't live like Christians and act like Christians. Yes, we do. But we're trying to do, go about it the wrong way, just like the Pharisees were putting on the people. We try to go about it the very same way. Preaching better than y'all letting on. Might be a long sermon. Hallelujah. All right, Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. I've got that one up there, babe. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made on account and for the sake of man, not man for the Sabbath. Oh. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. Rest was made for us. Not us trying to work to get in it. Rest, I'm going to say it to y'all a minute. Rest was made for us, not us working trying to get in it. It doesn't work that way. Works the opposite way. So Jesus made it very clear when he came. He said, y'all got this all mixed up. You got it backwards. This is what it looks like. And he said, the kingdom of the Father is upside down and backwards to what man thinks. Because man's always got a way to figure things out. But he said, the kingdom of God is trust, believe, rest. And I'll take care of it. And that's so simple. And it, we just like, that's just too easy. Because our brain automatically wants to grab onto something like that. But he said, we receive this by what? By faith. By believing. It may look too simple, too good to be true. This is. And we, when we believe his word and we trust his word, we can know that he is making our enemies our footstool. Amen? All right. Seven miracles that Jesus performed on the Sabbath. Now, one of the scriptures say, as was his custom, <laughs> or as was his habit, meaning that he did it way more than seven times. But we got seven miracles recorded in the word that Jesus did on the Sabbath day. Um, I'm going to run through these real quick. I've got them up here. They're kind of small, but and I'm not going to preach on all of them. I know y'all are glad but um, mark one jesus drives out an evil spirit in the synagogue jesus come to church and the evil spirit showed up showed up in that man mark 1 29 through 31 he heals peter's mother-in-law right after this he goes out of the synagogue goes over to peter's house and his his mother-in-law's got a fever so he heals her in matthew chapter 12 these are in chronological order by the way in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals the man with a withered hand. That was a setup. The Pharisees had that man there in the synagogue, and, and he had a withered hand. And they start asking Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Asking him all those questions. And so Jesus engages in their banner for just a second. And then he says, hey, stretch forth your hand. And when he did, guess what? It was already healed. I just love that. I don't think I've, I've really ever caught that before. Because Jesus has engaged them in their banner. And then the, the very reason they brought him in to have, you know, because he's got this withered hand. When he pulls it out, he's like, hey, dude. You know, it wasn't even, he, he had already been healed. He didn't say be healed, be whole. He didn't lay his hands on him. But when the, y'all with me? I just thought that was so good. He just sticks his hand out and it's like, oh, it's already whole. 
So Jesus did that inside the synagogue. Um, in John 5, 1 through 16, Jesus heals the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. He's outside the synagogue on the Sabbath day that day. In John 9, Jesus heals the blind man by making mud, which was in violation of the law, because you couldn't need anything. You couldn't need dough, and I guess you couldn't need mud. He spit in the ground, made mud. It was against the law. And he healed the man's eyes. He anointed his man, the man's eyes, and he went and washed his eyes, and he was born blind. The man at the pool of Bethesda was there for 38 years. Luke 13, verses 10 through 16, Jesus heals the woman that was bowed over for 18 years. She couldn't look up. So she all her, her whole, for 18 years, she had been like this. She couldn't get her head up. She couldn't look up. Everywhere she walked, she saw the ground. So he healed her. She'd been like that for 18 years. He healed her in the Sabbath, <clears throat> in the synagogue. And then in Luke 14, Jesus heals the man with dropsy. Anybody know what dropsy is? It ain't what your grandma said it was. You know, I got the dropsy, meaning I want to sit down every chance I get. <laughs> it, it was edema. It was swelling. It was water, taking on water in the, in the body. And it was usually the sign of cardiovascular disease or heart failure or something like that, kidney disease. And you're, you start swelling up. And it, the word literally means watery. You're looking like you're taking on water. So that's, he healed the man with dropsy. He also did that um, just outside the synagogue. And the Pharisees were trying to set him up with that. So we've got all these miracles that Jesus did. I just want to give you a, a broad picture of some of the things that they recorded in the scriptures about Jesus performing. It was the Sabbath and Jesus was healing. So when people were resting, Jesus was working. So when people were in the place just to hear the word and just to receive of him, he healed them. There was none of them in, in these scriptures, there's none of them that came to Jesus and asked him for healing. Jesus either came to them or he noticed them. That's what the scripture says. The woman that was bowed over for 18 years, it says when he saw her, when he noticed her, he called her to him. So we've got to understand that because of the Sabbath, we're using the Sabbath day as a picture of Sabbath rest. When they were resting, he was working. When we rest, he works. With me? John 5, verses 1 through 16, not going to read the scripture. We're going to focus on this man that was at the pool of Bethesda for just a few minutes. It was, there was a pool at the sheep market, which was close to the sheep gate, where they would bring all the sheep in to the city for sale and, and all that. So there was this pool there. It was actually like um, a place to bathe. It was a place to cool off. And it was also a place that, was, that there was a, a, a legend attached to it that when the angel came down and ruffled the waters, or move the waters, the first one in got healed. And I guess it was more than a legend because it actually happened. But they don't, when you go and you try to research all that, they, they really talk about it being more folklore than anything else. So as a, he, this man had been laying here for 38 years. Somebody say 38 years. How many of you are younger than 38? Dale, put your hand down. I know better than that. <laughs> So if you're younger than 38 years old, you've not lived long enough to be how long this man had been sick. And laying by the pool in a spot waiting for somebody to put him in the water at just the right time. The Bible says that he was an impotent man. And that just means without strength. He was weak. And it also means to be weak in the mind or weak in the body. Come on, church. So he said that around this pool, there were all kind of invalids. There was invalids, there was impotent, there was blind, and there was halt, and there was withered. All these kind of people around this pool because they just wanted to get in the pool. They just needed to get healed. They just wanted to go on with their lives. Can anybody say amen? You got this thing you've been dealing with, and you just want to get on with your life. You want this thing to be over with so you can get on with your life. Well, that's what they, they, were, they were dealing with. Now, the word Bethesda means a house of mercy. Or a house of kindness. So Jesus leaves the synagogue and walks over to the house of mercy. And let's see what's going on over here. Now this place is full. There's five porches. And a porch was there so that they weren't under the elements. They were shielded from the elements. Because some of them, that's where they lived their whole life. Because some parents would come and bring children that were invalids. And they would just put them, drop them off and leave. And they never saw them again. you got to understand, this was a place of hopelessness in the house of mercy. This was a place of sickness in the house of mercy and kindness. 
And so Jesus comes over and says, let's just see what we can mess up. Let's just see what we can mess up and fix and set right over here today. So he goes up to this man. He sees this man. It says there was a certain man. He goes over to him and he says, do you want to be made whole? He did not ask him, do you want to be healed? Because Jesus looked beyond what was laying in front of him. Because even though he was laying, he was not resting. Uh, See, we can lay down all day long, but if we're not resting... God knows and he has rest for us. And he said, do you want to be made whole? Meaning that there was more wrong with him than he couldn't get up and just, he couldn't walk. There was more wrong with him than that. So Jesus specifically said, do you want to be made whole? And dude tells us, shows us that there was something just as wrong in his head as there was in his body. Because the son of God was standing in front of him asking him, do you want to be made whole? And he started giving him excuses as to why he couldn't. He said, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. Every time I get started, somebody gets in the water ahead of me. I can't get there. I need somebody to put me in the water. And Jesus said, rise. That word literally means wake up. Some of us need to just wake up and see what is available to us. Wake up and see the Son of God is standing in front of you. Wake up. The the Lamb of God has come in through the sheep gate. And I'm going to be the the sacrifice that will end all of the misery and all of the the weight and the bondage. I'm going to be the sacrificial Lamb. I'm going to fix all of this. But right now I am here in front of you. Wake up. Take up your bed and walk. He... I believe he said, rise up for the man's mind. I believe he was making him whole with everything that he said. He said, wake up. Wake up, mind. Wake up and remember what it is to walk. Wake up and remember. And then he said, take up your bed and walk. And I love the next part. It says, and immediately. (laughs) He didn't have to wait for his legs to gain strength. I don't think he had to wait 15 minutes. I don't think he had to wait for this and that and the other to happen. When the Bible says immediately, I think it means right then when it came out of the lips of Jesus, his flesh had to obey, his mind had to obey, his body had to obey, and strength came up in him and he jumped up on his feet. I don't think nobody had to teach him to walk again. I don't think any of that happened. But when the Bible says immediately, I believe it means immediately. And that man stood up, rolled up that mat, shoved it up under his arm, And took off. The only problem was it was against the law to carry your bed on the Sabbath. You see how Jesus just stirred it up? He goes out in the street and the first people he meets, the Jews, the Pharisees. And they are not in awe. They're not even happy. They ain't even impressed that this man been laying there 38 years. On a bed, can't get in the water, can't get healed. They're not impressed in the least. You know what they said? It is against the law for you to tote your bed on the Sabbath. You want me to say that, Lord? And you may think bad about, I'm just going to say it. You may think bad about the Pharisees, but you let a drug addict walk in here that's just got saved. And they don't look Christianized. They don't dress Christianized. And Christians will be the first ones to say, well, I think you need to clean up a little bit. I think you need to come on, church. It ain't no different than what the Pharisees did. It ain't no different. We should be celebrating. You got saved? Yes, hallelujah. We might have less of them go right back out the door if we embrace them where they are and be willing to take people under your wing. Oh, wow, that's a bit. Corey, that's yours too. All right. I am. Take notes. So the Jews were furious. They were furious because Jesus had made light of their rules. And he told the man. He could have just told that man, get up, go home couldn't he (laughs) but he said let's stir some stuff up (laughs) just take your bed and walk through the streets with it let's stir up some devils and so he did and it did they came at jesus 
and it, it got rough. I'm not going to go through the rest of the story. But Jesus came to set things right. Jesus came to set things right. He was letting him know, it's, it's, this is my father's kingdom. This is what it looks like. There's not, there's not all these rules and not all this weight and not all this pressure of trying to remember, am I supposed to wear this shoe or that shoe or this color or that color? Or what am I, my, I just dropped a, a bowl and there's stuff broke everywhere and I can't pick it up and I got kids running around that might step. You know, it's that kind of stuff that they were living in under. And Jesus came to set things right. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I have called you to live like heaven and this don't look like it he did miracles on the Sabbath the day of rest to illustrate the principle that when we rest he works when we rest he works in Luke chapter 13 I'm going to read this it's just six scriptures and this is so good um, Luke chapter 6 uh, 13 I'm sorry Luke 13 verse 10 I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible, just because I can. Luke 13, verse 10, it says this. Um, now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman there who for 18 years had had an infirmity caused by a spirit. Important. A demon of sickness. She was bent completely forward and utterly unable to straighten herself up or to look forward. And when Jesus saw her, when Jesus noticed her, she's in the synagogue. He's teaching in the synagogue, and she just came to hear. She came to hear him speak. And when he saw her, he said, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are released from your infirmity. That means devil, go. You are released from your infirmity. And then he did something with his hand. He put his hand on her, and her body was straightened up. He did something illegal. He used his hand for something, and he healed her. He did something illegal right there in the church house. But she had just come for Sabbath. She had just come for rest. And when she came for rest, he came to heal. He came to fix. He came to restore. Look what happens. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly, there's another one of those immediately, she was made straight. <laughs> and she recognized, we know the devil was gone, but for this reason right here, she recognized and thanked and praised God. So we know that he, he took care of the devil first. He said, the infirmity's got to go. And then he laid his hands on her, and her body straightened up. But in verse 14, but the leader of the synagogue was indignant. Remember the drug addict walking through the door? Remember? Woo. But the leader of the synagogue was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. So come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. So that tells me there were some more people there that were sick. And he said, let's just nip it. We're going to nip this in the bud. This ain't the healing day. This is, this is the Sabbath, but it ain't for you. And we're talking about a certain day of the week for them, but for us it's a perpetual Sabbath. Don't forget that. Don't forget. I'm trying to draw some parallels here. So come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied to him saying, you play actor, you hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it out to water? He said, you're treating your animals better than people. You lead them out to water them. Look at what else he says. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Woo, that's, this is good. That's good. 
He says, she's a daughter of Abraham. She didn't do nothing. What did she do? Find me something in there she did. She was possessed with a spirit of infirmity and she just showed up for the Sabbath like this to listen because she couldn't even see him. And she listened and he saw her on the Sabbath not doing anything except being in his presence. And he called her to him. And she was strengthened. And the devil had to leave her. And she was made whole because of who she is. A daughter of Abraham. It's your identity. It's who you are that opens up the way into the Sabbath. And you just got to believe it. It's not about what you do. It's about believing. So here's the thing. If your answer hasn't got here yet. If your manifestation hasn't come yet. What do we do? What happens? Our mind goes into overdrive and says, you must be doing something wrong. You must be doing something wrong. Oh, yeah, I did miss church. Again, I'm preaching better than y'all letting on. I did think a bad thought, say a bad thought. I did a bad thought. I did, I did do that. That's why I'm not here. Oh, can I tell you something? That is living like hell. That is not living like heaven. That is not believing that his promise is still true and his promise is still sure. That is leaning over into the enemy's camp to adopt his thought process. Ugh. So we get to thinking, ah, ah, ah. I, I must have done something. And you know what that does? It drags us right out of our seat. Because our mind goes into overdrive and our mind begins to think, what did I do this week? What did I say this week? How did I, what did I, it must have been because I cut that person off. It must have been because I did this. It must have been, we start rehashing everything we did and didn't do. Everything we even thought about doing. We start going back through that and rehashing and thinking, that must be why I'm not healed yet. That must be why the bill collector's knocking. Well, they don't knock, they just call. And that must be why I'm getting these 42 calls a day from the bill collector. It must be, and I've been praying and I've been asking God and I've been sowing and I've been, I've been doing all these things, but it, this must be because I am not worthy. Oh, church. The people just came to Jesus and they found rest. He said, come to me and I'll give you rest and then you'll find rest. Who did the work? Who did the work? Who did the rest? We do. These people got to rest. When Jesus works, we rest. When we rest, Jesus works. Resting in what he said. Our healing comes from resting in what he said not what we see our resting comes from understanding that even if I don't have my answers yet in front of my face I believe what he said more than I believe what I see and I will continue to declare what he said until what he said is what I see oh come on church I will not be pushed off of this. I will not be drug out of my seat of rest. I will not let the enemy drag me out by my head. I will not let him pull me out in any way, shape, or circumstance. I am going to believe what he said because when I believe what he said, I get to rest and he does the work. I get to operate in a perpetual Sabbath because of Jesus, because of the blood that he shed, because of the way that he opened up into the Sabbath for me. And I get to rest and he does the work. Our healing comes from resting. Say it with me. My healing comes from resting. Stay in your seat. Jehovah Rapha. The word Rapha, healer, means the, com the comparative word. They've, inter they've used it interchangeably in the Old Testament. When you go and you look at the use of the word Rapha, it also means to relax. He 
Healing comes from being at rest, not working. <laughs> Contrary to what religion will whisper in your ear, healing comes from being at rest. Religion says you're not worthy, you've not done enough, or you've done too much. You see, religion is it's just it'll switch up with whatever your brain is thinking at the moment, whatever your mind comes up with. Religion will, uh, with they will it will agree with that one hundred percent, and it will agree with it from a view of what we think God is. That's the whole reason Jesus came is to get people to understand who He really is and His heart for us and His love for us. So religion will get us to believe in that we're not worthy, which pours on more stress and more fear. Come on now. I'm almost done, y'all. I got one, one and a half. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell somebody this. I don't know who came to hear this this morning, but I woke up hearing this. I was getting ready, and I heard it again. I was driving here, and I heard it again. I got here, and I was preparing everything and getting ready, and I heard it again. So listen, whoever this is for, fear will never let you rest. Uh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Fear will never let you rest. If you're afraid of how you're going to provide, you'll never rest. If you're afraid of what this diagnosis is going to do, you'll never rest. If you're afraid that you won't be able to keep your job because they brought somebody younger in, You'll never rest. If you're, I don't care what it is you're afraid of this morning. The Lord wants me to tell you that fear will never let you rest. If you're afraid for your children's future, you'll never rest. If you're afraid it ain't going to work right, you'll never rest. If you're afraid of driving down the road because you've had an accident before, you'll never rest. If you're afraid of walking in a building, you'll never rest. If you're afraid of committing yourself into a ministry that he's laid on your heart, you'll never rest. If you're afraid, you will never rest. Fear will never let you rest. It is a spirit. It is a living thing. It is calculating and it will listen to you talk about your own self. And it will play on those things and it will bring them back to you. Oh dear God, somebody needs to be free this morning. Perfect love throws fear out of doors every single time. You need to know that you are loved perfectly by a perfect father. And it has nothing to do with your ability to perform. Whew. Mm. Whew. Yeah. Come on right now. Just we're going to pause. God, I don't know who that's for this morning. But I speak love over their life. I speak, God, that they will come into a realization of your love this morning. Come on, church, pray. If it ain't for you, pray for the one that it is. God, I pray that a realization and a, a revelation of how much they are loved will pour into them like oil this morning. That it will begin to soak into every fiber of their being, God. That they will know that they are loved. That they will understand that it's not about works and it's not about performance and it's not about them. But you have already made a way into rest. And you are taking care of everything. And you love them like a good father does. Like a good daddy does and you've already gone before them and you have made a way where there seems to be no way you have already made them whole through the stripes of Jesus you've already got provision for them you've already got a way for them oh God we just speak life over that in the name of Jesus and I command fear to go in Jesus name in Jesus name unpause stress Stress is the body's reaction. Stress is the body's reaction to strain or pressure or harmful situations. You better hear this. Somebody's need to be write this down. The body's reaction to strain or pressure or harmful situations, whether real or perceived. Whether it's real or not. How many of you have ever worried about something that never happened? That's called stress. 
every bit of it has to leave. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Stress is your body's reaction to strain or pressure or harmful situations, whether they are real or just imagined. The stress is the same. Oh, did you hear me? The stress is the same. If it never happens, the stress is the same on your body and your body's reaction. Let me tell you something about stress. It is some of, it, stress is the number one of the n- number two, I believe, number two on heart disease. Here's nine diseases that stress plays a huge factor in. Listen to me, listen, listen, listen. Heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, headaches, depression, gastrointestinal problems, Alzheimer's, accelerated aging. That's just nine of the, the, the diseases that we deal with on a daily basis that is caused by stress. And what religion does is it puts the pressure on us to perform something that we are not required to perform. We are required to be His. And we yield to this stress and this pressure all the time. And we look at situations and circumstances and we think, well, what if this and what if that and what if? What if? What if a frog had wings? He wouldn't bump his butt every time he hopped. But we what if things to death. What if? What if it falls apart tomorrow? What if it don't? Ain't it the truth? Stop it. There's your word for the day. Stop it. Stop believing what the enemy says to you and whispers in your ear. Stay in your seat. Stay in your seat over your family member. Stay in your seat over your checkbook. (laughs) Stay in your seat over loved ones and relationships and your children. Stay in your seat. Stay in a seat of rest. It is 500 degrees in here. Just just so y'all know. Stay in your seat. Look, I'm, I'm fixing to tell you something, then I'm going to preach. Is that okay? I'm about done. <laughs> First John 4, 17. And he can't be back there and flip that screen and be up here and wonderfully turn the heat down for his life at the same time. So we're just going to, we're going to look at John. First John 4, 17. I don't have it. Yes, I do. First John 4, 17. First John 4, 17. If you got your Bible and you want to turn, turn. If you don't, you want to write it down, read it when you get home. Herein is our love made perfect. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, talking about Jesus, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Now what does that mean? I'm so glad you're asked. If Jesus ain't sick, I'm not sick. If Jesus ain't worried. If Jesus ain't broke. I know I hit on those same things all the time. I guess y'all know where I live. (laughs) If Jesus is not worried over relationships. If Jesus is not addicted. If Jesus is not, I'm not either. If Jesus got gas money, y'all missed a great place to shout right there. But listen, if Jesus is whole, guess what? I'm whole. 1 John 4, 17. When the enemy comes at me with a diagnosis, guess what? 1 John 4, 17 is true. That may be a fact, but the truth is, as he is, So am I in this world, and Jesus ain't sick, and I ain't sick. 
in the name of Jesus, what I, b- I believe what he said, and I will say it until my body decides to line up with what he said. And until that happens, I am staying in my seat because I ain't going out there where the boogeyman's at and getting killed. I'm going to stay in my seat. I'm going to stay right here. Do y'all see how this works? If we can get this and start living this, this is not just about good, good, a good way to preach or a good series to have. This, is, this should be something as sacred to us as our salvation. This should be something as sacred to us as the baptism in the Holy Ghost. This should be something as sacred to us as joy. That's another thing we lay down, but it's because we don't rest. Because when we rest, we'll find joy in the place where he's at, in his presence. Amen? So we, the thing about this seat. This, this seat that I've been preaching over, do you know what? The Bible says, the first part of Psalm 110 says, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. So whose seat is this? I think I'm being silly, but I ain't. I want you to see this the rest of the week. Hey, Jude. You know what that doctor said. But I know that you're not sick. You ain't sick, are you? You ain't got the diabetes, do you? Okay. Well, then I don't either. Y'all want me to make it harder? I mean, because this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to rest in what he said. This seat of rest sits at the right hand of the Father. So I am in close fellowship. When he whispers, guess who's going to hear it? Me. When he gives me some instruction, guess who's going to hear it? Me. Because there ain't no room for nothing else. It's me and the Father. I want you to have a picture. Everybody looking? You going to remember this this week? This is the best seat ever. I don't even have to work. This is the Hey, Judy. This is, this is the best seat ever. Jesus, you know that situation I got at work? Yeah, I know, yeah. Well, you, what do you think about it? Don't worry about it, okay. You're working it out? Thank you. So you mean I don't need to go cuss nobody out? Okay. Are you sure about that one, Jesus? That's what he said, I didn't say that. Are you sure I can't? <laughs> so you mean I don't need to stay up till like 4 o'clock in the morning wondering how I'm going to pay bills? Because you said you'd supply because I, I sow seed, I sow, and you give harvest? Okay. Well, what do you want me to do? Oh, abide. John, put that next scripture up, Mom. He said, if you abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. In, the, in verse 7, it says this. Next one. It ain't going there. Abide in me. Show the next one, Marty. If you abide in me, somebody say if, 
then. If you abide in me and my abide in you, you can ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And it shall be done for you. Those are red letters in this book. He has called us into a relationship of fellowship, of abiding, of leaning over on him with every care and every stress and every worry that tries to drag us out of the chair by our head. We lean over on him. And he says, I'll do whatever you ask if you stay in this seat. Because it just, his heart can't not. Because he loves us so much. And when we stay close to him and just leaned over on him, he is enthralled with our love. And he just, he desires us to be close. He didn't ask us to fix anything. He didn't even ask us to figure it out. He's asked us to trust him. And in this place of fellowship, the answers that I need are there. Not out here running around like a chicken with my head cut off. It's right here abiding in this seat. Choosing to stay in your seat is sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do. I'm going to say that one more time. Choosing, because it's a choice, to stay in your seat is sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do. Especially when the world around you tells you that you should worry. Lord of mercy, how many Facebook memes have you seen? If you ain't a good mama, or if you're a good mama, you're going to worry. Lies. Because that's contrary to what this says. And he said, be anxious for your kids. Be anxious for your money. Be anxious for your job. Be anxious for whatever's in front of you. He said, be anxious. I don't know what nothing means to y'all, but in the Greek it means nothing. It means Hebrew, nothing. It means zero, nothing, no thing. Be anxious for no thing. Well, we live in a world, then you better get in your seat. That's all I got to tell you. We live in a world that is filled with stress and pressure and anxiety. And that means what? To be pulled in all different directions at the same time. We live in that world. that, But you have a seat. You have a seat. You have a covenant seat of fellowship with the Father who is working on your behalf to make your enemies your footstool. So if you're worried, you're not in your seat. Because here in this place of fellowship, he reminds us of what he said. And what he said is true. With me? Yes? Good? About done. I've said that how many times? I'm just going to say this for whoever. If it, it may be on somebody that lives. It's probably not nobody in this house. So it's probably somebody that's going to watch this on live stream. It's not your anxiety unless you want it to be. That irks me to be talking to somebody. Well, my anxiety just, you know. Oh, it's yours? Well, that's good because it ain't mine. You can have what you say I'm on my tiptoes looking at the live stream nobody in this house you can have what you say it's not stop saying it don't say my anxiety no more it don't belong to you it belongs to the enemy that looks like living like hell that's not your life that's not living like heaven that's not yours stop taking what don't belong to you 
Oh, that's, that's preaching right there. Stop taking what don't belong to you. It's not your anxiety. You have a seat. Last scripture I want to cover today. And we're going to be done. Let y'all out of here. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 29. This is so good. I'm going to pull out one phrase out of this. The Lord was causing the manna to fall. He said six days you're going to collect manna, but on the sixth day you're going to collect double. Don't collect double on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But on Sabbath, on Saturday, well, we're calling it Saturday. But on the sixth day, I want you to collect double. Now, they tried to collect double on some days because you know what? They was worried about what if this don't, even though he said, yeah, uh, okay. Anyway, so they would, and you know what would happen in the morning? It'd be rotted, full of worms. But if they got just enough for each day, it was it was good. But he said, on the sixth day, I want you to collect double. And some folks didn't listen to that either. And they just got enough for one day. Well, he said, but what if he meant, y'all don't be knocking the Israelites. Now we do the same thing. Well, he said, don't, he said get double, but, you know, he, all these days before we tried to get double and it rotted. So if we try to get double, it might do, because he said, but he probably meant, that's why we anxious all the time. Uh, okay, anyway. So this is, this is the father talking to him, he's, and, and he's telling him why. He said, he said <laughs> are y'all getting this? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Don't go pick up food on the Sabbath day. Stay in your place. Because the Sabbath day, I take care of the provision. Because as you rest, I work. I provide. Now this may sound real simplified. But if we will start living this way. I'm going to give you a prime example and I'm done. Abide, settle down, stay in your seat. I was having a rough day at work this week. <clears throat> I was trying my best to stay in my seat, but I was getting drug out by my head. And I sent my, Mar my, my, my Marty, ain't that sweet? I sent my Marty a text, and I said, I'm having a day. I said, I just wish I was at home. And he said, you know you get to rest. And I'm like, don't you preach my sermons to me. And I stopped, and I was standing at my window in my office texting him. And I went over to my chair, and I saw this chair sitting here in this sanctuary. And I sat down in it. Because sometimes, you know, you just got to make a, you just got to do something. And I leaned back in my chair like a boss. And I said, you know what, he's right. That's on live stream, y'all heard me say it. get to rest I had about four different situations that I was trying to think through and figure out and move stuff around and how was this going to work and how was that going to work and I just sat down and I said Lord I'm just going to I'm just I'm leaning over on you because you've told me not to worry you've told me not to be frustrated that's not part of my inheritance rest is my inheritance me and the Lord just talked just a couple of minutes. It wasn't no long, drawn-out praying in tongues in the Holy Ghost because I'd have scared everybody else in the office. I said, you just you made it so that I don't have to worry about this. So you know what, Lord? You know the best way for this to work out. So I'm not going to worry. And that was that. And within, can I say, 15 minutes, all four situations fell into place in a way that I couldn't have done it if I'd have tried for two days. And I had walked outside, and the last one fell into place. It was a phone call, and it fell into place. 
And I thought I was going to have a Holy Ghost fit right outside my door because I realized I got to rest. And he did the work. This works. This is the word. I ain't making this stuff up. That's why I gave you 400 Bible verses last week. This is the truth of God's word. And we get to decide, will I rest or will I fret? Will I rest or will I stress? Will I rest or will I be anxious and worried? Because the world does not need to see one more person worried and anxious about everything that's going on in the world. They need to see a church that is confident in the one who has created us and made us. Because they, they are not interested in a kingdom that is just as fearful and dreadful as the one that they live in. They need a kingdom of love and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and righteousness and rest. And when we begin to personify this rest in our lives, when we just choose something that simple as saying, you know what, I can't, I, worrying about this is not going to change it not going to fix it and we just take a minute with the father and we say i just i just i don't know what to do but you do you've got this figured out you've got all this under control anyway and i choose to be at rest i can't say that everything will, will happen the way it did for me on thursday but i do know he's promised that he will cause everything to work together for your good and he will see it through to the end Our heads will close your eyes for just a minute. Father, we love you. you. Give us some music or either come play the keys, Marty. <laughs> we are so grateful for your presence in this house this morning. And Father, I know that in a place with this many people, we've got people that are worried. And I don't have this down pat I don't have I don't have it all figured out and that's okay because I'm learning to, to rest I'm learning to stay in my seat and I'm learning that's that's the key word but father I pray that your word that you you've shared with me and we've shared with this house goes down deep into us and that we realize that we really can live this out in our most stressful situations you still have a seat for us right next to yours we love you Jesus and we're so grateful for your word we're so grateful that rest comes first we're so grateful that we just need to believe you and that when we rest, you work. We're grateful for you this morning. Grateful that you've already gone before us. Grateful that fear has to leave in Jesus' name. Grateful that we get to operate in perfect love. And function through rest. With your heads bowed this morning, I just want to ask, is there anyone here that you're saying, Angel, I've just, I'm, I, I, I need a place to sit down. I need to see... I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if, if what's driving your head and pulling you out of that place that you're stressed over jobs or work or relationships or lost loved ones or people have died unexpectedly or whatever's going on in your life, whatever you're stressing over, whatever you're dealing with, it doesn't matter. The Lord wants you to rest today. And me and Marty just want to pray for you this morning. We just want to pray for you this morning. We want to line up with you. Our laying our hands on you is not going to fix it. But we want to come into agreement with you. That you're going to find a place and you're going to choose to sit in a place of rest instead of stress and worry and fear. Anybody? 